And you know, it just it just seems like that. Uh, However you live your life, it seems like to me now, it seems like the, the Lord isn't going to say uh, how many uh, letters were behind your name or uh, how many people did you save and all that kind of thing. I, I think what He's going to say is, after I gave you all these things, these difficulties in life, as well as the victories that you received in life, what kind of a person did you become? For nearly 80 years, Ingram Funeral Home has been serving the funeral, burial, and final needs of families in the southeastern Illinois area, with a total of three different locations. For the first 61 years, my family ran that business. Hi, my name is Aaron Curtis Ingram, and this is the story of how Ingram Funeral Home got its start. My great-grandfather, Fred Amos Ingram, was the founder of Ingram Funeral Home in Albion, Illinois. He started it during the Great Depression in 1938. Fred would live on to see his son, my grandfather, Curtis Byron Ingram, add the West Salem and Allendale locations in 1963 with continued success. Even after my great-grandfather's death in 1980, my grandparents, Curtis and Dolores Ingram, would continue running the family business until they sold their business in 1999. Today, Ingram Funeral Home is still running under new management. This is the story of a man who, as Fred Ingram's father, Charles, put it, was destined for more. See, I thought about that. What was <laughs> Oh, just uh, just a loving, caring uh, father that uh, was uh, able, ready, willing, and able to do anything for his family. Yeah. Which we just had. Mother, father, and myself. Yes, yeah. that was a family. Well, what did he tell you about his upbringing? How was he raised? Well, times were tough. Yeah. They were really tough back then. And uh, he, uh, they lived on a farm, but his dad wasn't so much a f farmer. He was more of a truck farmer, they called it, because we call it gardening today, I guess. And uh, he worked in a coal mine. Yeah. And uh, that was what you did there. In fact, that's why he lived uh, where he lived, so he could work in a coal mine. I remember him saying that it didn't matter whether you were sick or whether you were well, you went to work. I remember that about him. And then uh, his hairline went way back on his head. I remember that. Uh -huh. Had such a long forehead. He, he had a, a smile that was real endearing. And I mean, he would, uh, when uh, he smiled, you knew he was, it was a favorable thing. My grandpa, my grandpa. You know, he, he, it was, it was important to him. It was really important to him that you move on from the coal mines. He, yeah. he, th he thought that was a life that you did not want to lead. Right. You did not want to, to do that because he was relegated to that. That was his destiny. He could, he could not get out of it. Yeah. He had, he had to live it. He had to do it. Yeah. But he knew that it wasn't good, that there was better things. Yeah. And and to uh, to stay there and live in it was kind of your fault because you, it was up to you yeah. to get out and do something. Yeah. Well, now let me tell you too about uh, when my dad 
was all set to graduate from high school, he was sitting at the breakfast table and he told his dad yeah. that uh, he wanted him to get a job in a coal mine so he'd have a place to go the following day. Yeah. And uh, his dad said, okay. My grandpa, Charlie, says, okay, I'll get you a job. Because you had to have pool in order to get a job because jobs weren't that plentiful back then. And so anyway, uh, my grandpa says, okay. So he went to work and, and uh, he came home and, and uh, he didn't say anything about it. And my dad said he was so anxious to ask him if he got a job in the coal mine for the following day. And uh, his dad didn't say anything. And uh, so he couldn't stand it anymore the following day. He says, well, did you get me a job in a coal mine? And he says, no, I didn't. He says, if, if you uh, go to the coal mine, he says, you'll never come out. Uh, <clears throat> you'll never do anything else. So he says, uh, uh, <clears throat> you're destined for more than that. <laughs> She couldn't pay any intuition or anything because they didn't have any money. They t took everything they could get together in order just to live, just to feed them and, and clothe them. Uh, my Aunt Thelma was friends with this girl who had more means than she had. Yeah. And so therefore, they did things kind of together. And they both went to this uh, nurse's training, they called it back then. She got a job working at the Cook County Hospital. And back then, Cook County Hospital was a prestigious place because all of the politicians got their family in there. Oh. And, and Chicago was just as political as it is today, yeah. if not more so. So uh, uh, after her dad worked at uh, a grocery store, then uh, he would go by this funeral home. And I believe the name was Mr. Freeman, hmm. Freeman Funeral Home. And uh, he would go by and, and uh, he asked, he would ask that Mr. Freeman came out and, and he befriended him and talked to him. And uh, he asked Mr. Freeman one day if there's anything he could do to help him because he needed the extra money. Uh, you know, like wash cars or wash windows or anything like that. Yeah. And this Mr. Freeman says, well... I'll see if anything comes up, I'll let you know. Yeah. So, uh, sure enough, it wasn't but a short time that uh, this Mr. Freeman asked Dad if he wanted to work for him a couple of days a week that uh, he could use him washing cars and, and washing windows and huh. trimming the shrubs and things like that. <laughs> now, this uh, uh, was back in the day when... Uh, Funeral homes had what they called lady attendants. They weren't licensed. They didn't go to school. They just were there to assist the ladies and the children when uh, somebody had a death occur mm -hmm. in the family. This uh, lady attendant uh, became ill and couldn't do a lot of the things that she normally did. And so uh, Mr. Freeman asked him if he couldn't uh, kind of fill in some of those places where it was possible, where a young person could do that. And so he did. And uh, he got, and he thought that job was much more pleasant than the grocery store and the work he had to do there. And besides that, you got to meet uh, a varied type of clientele rather than just the, the grocery store. So he got kind of interested because of this Mr. Freeman. Wow. And uh, and not only that, he got to drive the cars. He did? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The funeral home had a hearse that had a motor. Yeah. And so he got to drive that. He thought that was all right. Yeah. He kind of liked that. This funeral home was one of the first to have uh, a motorized hearse. Oh, so yeah. he did that kind of work at the funeral home as well. as, And then that uh, gave him an interest in embalming. And... Uh, that really intrigued him. Embalming uh, really intrigued him. So 
uh, he really had a desire to want to learn embalming. Yeah. My Aunt Thelma, his sister, was working at the Cook County Hospital, and his only hope, his only shot of ever getting anywhere in life other than working for somebody was to go to Chicago and get this training at the Warsham College of Mortuary, at the Warsham College, Albert Warsham College, I believe was the name of it then. <laughs> and uh, so my Aunt Thelma got my dad a job as an orderly nights, working nights. So he, got, he took that job of working nights at Cook County Hospital as an orderly, and he went to school during the day to learn embalming and funeral service. As he was working nights, he said that his sister would do a lot of the work that he was supposed to do just so he could sleep uh. there at the end, and he could uh, be ready to go to school the following day. But he was in the same class with doctors. Uh. He took the same anatomy classes, and uh, biology classes as the doctors. Hmm. He could have stayed one more year and got uh, MD huh. back then. Wow. He could have stayed one more year and, and got it. But see, that was out of the question because he couldn't afford it. What did Fred Ingram and Ingram Funeral Home do during the Depression? It really wasn't in existence uh, yet, see, because I was 29 and my dad was working for, uh, during the Depression, big, a big part of the Depression. Uh, business got better as time went on from, from uh, the crash in 29. Yeah. See, he, uh, he couldn't uh, go into business for himself until uh, 38. He had, uh, he had to work for the Harrisburg Funeral Home in Harrisburg, Illinois. Yeah. And he worked there, and uh, he, he really made pretty good for that time. Yeah. And it was a good job, and uh, he, we lived there during the flood. There was, Harrisburg was actually flooded. Huh? And it didn't affect the funeral home because it was on a kind of a knoll. But uh, a lot of Harrisburg was underwater. It came up to, you know, three or four feet of inside of their stores. It was a devastating time, and you know, uh, they had a tough time coming back out of that too. You know, it, they were affected for years from that flood. Yeah. Flood of '37 was it? And see, the, in fact, <clears throat> that was one of the reasons why he moved on, was because people were having trouble meeting their payments, meeting their obligations, yeah. and you know, right. you, you could take them to court, and what would you have? A piece of paper? that said they owed you. So that was his decision to, uh, to strike out on his own. How he had the nerve to strike out on his own in 1938, I, I don't know, you know. It just took, I, well, for him it had to take a lot of faith and a lot of determination. After the Harrisburg flood of 1937, Fred Ingram and his young family moved to a town 58 miles north of Harrisburg called Albion, Illinois. This was during the Great Depression and was a very hard time to start a business. Yet, despite the odds against him, Fred still opened his own business on March 7, 1938. Oh, and by the way, one of the questions is, uh, who did he buy out? He didn't buy anybody out. He started from scratch. He had he had he had brand new town, brand new facilities. I mean, he he started from scratch. I say brand new. I mean, he had made do with a regular home, and uh, he bought a used equipment. He bought a used embalming table. He started out in a in a regular home and uh, did embalming in the basement of that home, and or in the home he did embalm home embalming as well. Wow. And uh, uh, he did did not have a uh, business to rely on. See, he started from scratch. So he had to get the business from day one. And he was already in a town that had, a, had an established firm. 
that had been there for quite a while. Wow. And they really had a strong business. And uh, he went uh, in against that. And uh, it took him a long time. He had a tough time. But, you know, I, but I'll be honest with you, I didn't really feel that when I was growing up. You know, I didn't feel like that we were, uh, uh, had to do without. Yeah. That uh, we were just as, as uh, common as everybody else. We weren't, uh, we didn't feel above anybody and we didn't feel below anybody. We just kind of felt run of the mill folks. There was no real status. Yeah. There's one nice thing about the town we were in. It didn't have a lot of status. It had some, but not a lot of it. Albion? Yes, Albion. Did they both have the same interest in running the funeral business? You know, I really don't know if my mother was interested in the funeral service or not, but she was so interested in seeing to it that my dad succeeded at whatever he did that uh, she was more than ready, willing, and able to do whatever it took to make it go. But I tell you what, uh, I live next door to a veterinary, and uh, oh, yeah. my life goal there for 10 years, I'd say, I was going to be a veterinarian. I'd help him clean up his instruments and everything. You know, I got a lot of good experience with him. But uh, <laughs> one day, we had to go into the chicken coop. Oh, and my word, it hadn't been cleaned out in three years, at this chicken coop. Oh, my God. He took a hole, lifted up that roost, and he took this hole, and, he did it, and that stirred up a dust. And before I could get out of there, I was sneezing and coughing. And, oh, my gosh. And, so, and uh, I found out that the chicken poop and me did not get along. So, you know, that kind of that kind of discouraged me from being a veterinarian. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did you and Grandpa meet? We really, uh, we always, I guess, knew each other because we grew up in the same town, but uh, he was, uh, and we both went to First Christian. But, mm -hmm. you know, we never were uh, in school at the same time because, uh, he graduated one year, and then I was in high school the next year. After he got out of mortuary school, I guess that was... Uh, so 56? Well, it was, it was 56, yeah, and I graduated in 57. And uh, he'd be out in the yard at the funeral home working when I'd walk by going to school. The doctor who owned the, the home where we were on 4th Street wanted to move in there wanted us to leave. Uh -huh. So we had to buy a place somewhere in town. Mm. And so we moved to, uh, we found, the dad found the place in Main Street, on Main Street, there where it's presently located. Yeah. And uh, he uh, started establishing visits there. We built a chapel on the side of a regular house. Mm. This was the house that he bought on Main Street. So that's what it looked like. During the 50s, I guess. Yes, and this is where you grew up. That's when I grew, yes, I grew up there. Wow. Yes. Okay. What caused the fire? Uh, a faulty flu. Faulty flu? Mm-hmm. And I was, uh, let's see, just about two doors down from the funeral home because uh, a friend, a girlfriend of mine was having a slumber party and uh, there was a bunch of us girls there and uh, they said, the funeral home's burning. <laughs> We'd almost look out the window or look out the door and see it. It was just two doors up. We didn't notice it. We didn't know it. You know, uh, it, it worked just fine. And, Somehow the the metal pipe that went into the flue rusted out, mm. and we didn't realize it. In 1956, after nine months of training, Curtis graduated from the Warsham College of Mortuary Science in Chicago. After taking his written exam, 
and receiving his apprenticeship permit, Curtis served a year of apprenticeship at his father Fred's funeral home in Albion. After his year of apprenticeship was completed, Curtis took his practical exam and stood before the State Board of Examiners. After receiving his funeral director's and embalmer's license to practice in the state of Illinois, Curtis was drafted into the U.S. Army. In uh, 1958, I was drafted yeah. into the Army, United States Army. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not the Mexican Army? Yeah. And then we were married in September of 1960. Had a baby the next week. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> that, that was nine months later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I just kidding. out of the army and we got married and had two little babies yeah two little boys we were looking for a place you know but we were i was working for my dad 48 dollars a week in the funeral and furniture business which by the way the furniture business was uh, there to keep the funeral business afloat yeah and uh my dad went up to uh, west salem and delivered some flowers out of courtesy because the flower shop was shorthanded and they asked if he would have the time to do it. And he took the time to do it. He really didn't have, but he took the time to take some flowers to West Salem. And he started talking to that Stanley King who owned the funeral home there. In West Salem? Yeah, in West Salem. And uh, he, Stanley King said, well, he had tried several different people there to come in and take over the business and none of them worked out he just couldn't seem to settle down to that and my dad asked if he'd be interested in selling it to us yeah because we were i was out of school we had a young family and uh stanley says yeah yeah he'd be interested in that huh. he'd see about that so he started looking around and and uh <clears throat> Uh, he offered it to us. When were your two sons born? Well, let's see. Son number one was born in 1961. That'd be June the 23rd, 1961. Go. He's standing right here, so you better and say <laughs> the right one. <laughs> and then number two... Uh, that uh, the first one was Jeffrey Kirk, and the second one was Jerry Dirk, and uh, he was born uh, August the twenty first, nineteen sixty three. Uh, we moved to West Salem when uh, Jeff was two and a half. Now an ironic thing is that uh, I was two and a half when we moved from Harrisburg to Albion. Jeffrey was two and a half when we moved from Albion to West Salem. Can't remember just how, Jerry, Jerry was just a few months old. I think from six, August, six or eight months old, something like that. From August to December. We moved to uh, West Salem, December of 1963. Wow. And we took over the business of January 1 of 1964. What did Jeff and Jerry do to help you and Fred out with the business? Well, they just did a lot of things. Uh, in fact, uh, there were times when uh, we were busy doing other things and were not on the location where they were, and, and Jeffrey even drove the ambulance. Whenever I got old enough to drive, I, uh, I drove the ambulance, and it was very uh, high stress, I can remember, you know, a lot of a lot of different ambulance calls that I went on. You know, I probably drove too fast, but with the person in the back, when you think the person in the back is dying, you know, you're you're wanting to try to help them, and the best thing I could do to help them was to get them to the hospital. So that's why I drove as fast as I could to the hospital, and probably took risk that I shouldn't have taken. 
but fortunately I never had an accident and, and never uh, was involved in an accident and was very fortunate that that, that didn't, uh, didn't ever happen to me. Did Grandpa Curtis and Grandpa Fred um, drive the ambulance? To, I know Grandpa Curtis drove the ambulance, but did Grandpa Fred drive the ambulance too when you when you drove? Was he with you or? Yes, there was there was one in particular call ambulance call that I remember. My my mom and dad were gone for some reason, and my brother was home, and my brother had went down. There was uh, for some reason my brother had had. I think already taken the ambulance down to the house. It was a, it was our neighbor, and it was a new ambulance, brand new ambulance. My dad had had bought, and I don't know, it had to have been in the 70s, so it, in the late 70s at that. So it was a brand new ambulance, and about that time, cars and ambulances and cars in general had started to get smaller. So they were trying, you know, fuel economy and all of that was, was coming into play. So at any rate, my brother was down there, and him and the Moravian minister had gotten this guy loaded up, our neighbor. And they were, they were bringing him out of the house about the time I got there. And the, the minister kind of gave one end to me. So we're coming down the steps, so I'm holding up one end, and my brother's on the other end, and we're trying to carry him down the steps, and of course I'm backing up down the steps. And we make it down the steps all right and everything, and put him in there, and, he, and the guy has a heart condition too. So when he had a heart condition, he had to have the, the back of the cot raised up, so he had to be sitting up as much as he could. And his foot was sticking out about, about a foot. He was sticking out, and we couldn't shut the back of the ambulance door. <laughs> I mean, we, we couldn't shut the door. So I remember I went around to the side and got in the side door and tried to, tried to lift the guy up so that we could, so we could get him in. He, he'd had a stroke, and one foot, one leg was stiff. So I was able to get him worked up enough or whatever. I finally got the back door shut and got in and was, was going down and I asked him, I guess I asked his wife, you know, where are we going? We're, we're going to Alnley to the hospital and Alnley was the closest hospital to West Salem where we live. She says, no, we go to Fairfield to the hospital. In Fairfield, you had to drive all the way through Albion to get to Fairfield. So uh, we take off and I remember I, I radioed on the radio uh, my grandmother and they wanted my grandfather to meet me. But any rate, so I got, I got through Albion and got through, met my grandfather. My grandfather, I saw him walking uh, from the park where the picnic was through the front of the high school. I pulled in, picked him up, and we got in and headed on to Fairfield. And while we were in the back, the guy that, that we had picked up uh, in the back, he had passed away. And, and my grandfather uh, gave him CPR, and he revived him. He brought him, he brought him, back, uh, brought him back to life with, with CPR. And this is going down the highway at, you know, 90 plus miles an hour probably uh, on, the, on the road between uh, Albion and Fairfield. And we got him there and got him into the hospital, and he uh, he lived. Uh, he lived. He outlived. He outlived my grandfather. Uh, he out he outlived him, <laughs> strangely enough. And uh, I remember the wife, because uh, she was sitting in the back of the ambulance riding with him, and uh, she was witness to everything that my grandfather did to revive him, the CPR and everything that he did to revive him. And uh, I remember her thanking him for what he did in the back of the car, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, my grandfather, he was like glad to do it, you know? He didn't, uh, he didn't mind. He didn't mind at all to do it. So after uh, this lady thanked 
my grandfather or you know maybe it was before my grandfather and I had a chance to talk there and in the hospital while we were waiting to see what was going to happen with the guy you know we had a chance to talk and uh, he told me he said you uh, you got to Albion pretty quick because <laughs> he knew where I was he knew where I was coming from and he knew how long it took to get there and he knew I was driving pretty fast and he probably he probably wasn't real happy I was driving as fast as I was and uh, I, I wasn't either if I didn't think I don't know if I didn't think it was that important I wouldn't have been driving that fast and for the record I don't drive that fast anymore <laughs> so um, what was a normal day like for you and grandma running the funeral business and the ambulance service Hmm. I don't think we had a normal day. I think I, I think it was all pretty well varied. I would I would have to say it was you know pretty pretty normal, pretty boring. Uh, it was you know we went to school and we came home and you know watched TV and then went went to bed. You know I mean it was it was there was nothing uh, nothing unusual about it. It was pretty pretty normal, I, I think. Pretty just had a fairly normal uh, normal childhood. After everybody would go to school, I walked all the time. I mean, I just took time to walk because uh, I, it was really confining because uh, we were on the phone 24-7. Oh, yeah. Well, it would start out with us trying to organize the day, uh, activities of the day, depending on what we had to do. If we had to uh, get ready for a funeral or if I had to finish up embalming, I, I would usually get a call during the night and I would start the embalming and I'd finish up during the day. Or I would uh, uh, do the embalming at night and then we'd have, I'd have to meet with the family the following morning and arrange the funeral, visitation and funeral. And uh, I contacted the preacher and and got the flowers together for the for the casket and the family and arranged for opening of the grave and made sure there was space at the cemetery for the person and, and things that uh, needed to be done in order to uh, complete the service. Yeah. For several years we were the flower shop too. Yes, yes, for several years we were the flower shop. There was no flower shop in the town, so we took the orders and ordered flowers for people. But he did the he he'd get under the shoulders and I'd get under the legs and we and and we put them in the casket. We dressed and casket. I do the hair and the makeup and we do it together. Yeah. And it was it was hard work. It was really hard work. But but you know we were young. And we wanted to do it. Yeah. We were ambitious. <laughs> As Grandpa Fred got older, did his age or his health get in the way of his work? Didn't really. He, you know, if anybody could die with their boots on, it was him. He, uh, he just continued to work. He, he wouldn't uh, give up. And even though he had uh, <clears throat> difficulty in breathing and so forth, he, he kept up and did uh, what he could. Right up until he went, had to go to the hospital and, and uh, just deteriorate. His condition deteriorated because of his heart condition. His heart was just degenerative and, and he just couldn't go any longer. But he, he did continue as long as he could. Yeah. He didn't give up. He, he kept going. He, he was full on funeral service from day one until the day he died. Really, he... He didn't let up. So, to think that my dad gave me the stability and support that he did was, it was absolute divine planning and divine intervention. After Fred Ingram's death in 1980, Curtis felt up to the challenge of assuming the role and responsibility of CEO and owner of all three Ingram Funeral Home locations because of the instruction and camaraderie received from the years of practice with his father. What were the challenges you and the funeral business faced after Fred, Grandpa Fred's death? 
Well, it was just more intense. Uh, uh, my dad was the stability of the uh, business at Albion and, and that area. Uh, and to when he passed away, then not to have him anymore, <clears throat> well, it left kind of a void. <clears throat> but uh, I really, on the other hand, felt uh, qualified to take on and take care of it, uh, to have another uh, business, which, you know, we worked so closely together when we were working uh, together that uh, it wasn't a, a real big step in a transition. It was it was a kind of a blend uh, that uh, <laughs> kind of merged at the time. Yeah. And uh, it, it just seemed kind of natural, really. Because I grew up in that business that was there, you know, and then we bought West Salem and Allendale, and, and uh, it, that business continued to flourish, and... And with the combination of the three, it was the same thing, only more of it. We accomplished this together as kind of a team, like we pulled together as a team and we had an excellent time and a, and a real excellent relationship with those that we came in contact with. Yeah. And uh, actually, we, we knew everybody and we spent time with them. Yeah. And, uh, and we got to know them and their family and who they were and, and how they were related. I used to pride myself in knowing who was related to who yeah. and, uh, and what relationship they were. And it was a pleasurable, enjoyable time and it was an actual service to the community. It doesn't seem like it's that much anymore. But I've been retired for 17 or so years, so it's had time to change. Were the last uh, 20 years easier, more enjoyable than the previous years running? Well, no. Uh, we, we knew a little more about it and knew more about what to do when. Uh, that's true. Uh, and how to handle situations a little better. We knew that. But, uh, you know, it got to where it, it was a little more intent, I believe. <laughs> Oh, we weren't quite the temperament that we were when we were younger. So, you know, it, it really reached a good time for us to move on and, and for somebody else to take over. The timing seemed right. And then, uh, first and foremost, my health was was in a bad situation or deteriorating situation. Yeah. And so uh, that was really the determining factor was my health. But, uh, but, but things really didn't get any easier as we got older, no. I realize I'm pretty close to the finish line, but uh, you know, I don't know what I'd go back and do over. I'd probably make more mistakes than I did the first time through. It was our passion to, to do what we did, and, and it, was, it was enjoyable life. But like everything else, it'll end too soon. For 19 more years, Curtis and Dolores Ingram would continue the full operation of all three Ingram Funeral Home locations until they decided to sell their business in 1999. You've told me things that I don't think I'll ever forget. Well, some of it maybe you better forget. <laughs> <laughs> There's I'm some of that stuff maybe you'll forget. <laughs> <laughs> How do you count in German again? Oh, I swy thry fear fum sex even alk nine sane. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember that forever. Give me a hug, Grandpa. Oh, yeah. Come here. Uh -oh. I love you. I love you thank too. you so much for doing this interview. Well, thank you. It's our pleasure. It's a pleasure for us to. We enjoyed it. Graduation. Yeah. Thanks for being a whale of a kid. Yeah. <laughs> I've tried. Uh -huh. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that.
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. I have already come Tis grace that brought me safe thus far And grace will lead me home When we've been there ten thousand years Bright shining as the sun We've no less days to sing God's praise Than when we first begun Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God Praise God, 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 praise God.